Welcome. Be sure to like and subscribe for more scary stories. Or I will come for you. I'd like to thank Goatwack for recently joining the Curator's Disciples. Your viewership is very much appreciated. Today's stories are a little longer than usual. However, no less fucked up. Story number one. My mother and father were killed in an awful car accident when I was six years old. Since then, I have been raised by my aunt and uncle in Texas along with my older cousins. It took a while for me to adjust to this new familiar arrangement, but in time I came to accept my aunt as a loving mom and my uncle as a trusting, sensible father figure. The person I was closest to was my cousin Lacey, more like a brother and sister. Living in Texas, we often went hunting and fishing. My uncle taught us to be expert marksmen, especially in hog hunting, which comes in handy in the southern United States, where wild pigs are considered a pest. By the time I was 13, I had become a terrific shooter. My uncle sometimes joked that I would become a police sniper. Over time, my cousin and I both developed an interest in computers. This was in the late 90s and early 2000s, when the internet was a much newer phenomenon. The idea of an information superhighway was very fascinating to both of us. Lacey, two years older than me, graduated sooner and was accepted into the University of Texas with a scholarship in computer sciences. As for me, my initial enthusiasm for computers waned into casual interest and I chose to focus more on sports journalism. In the summer of 2006, I finished my sophomore year of college at USC and Lacey had been working for a technical firm in Houston for the past few years. It was my summer break, and I hadn't seen her in a while, so I flew into town to visit her for a few days. After catching up, she brought up a subject that has since come to haunt me something she referred to as the Dark Web. One of her co-workers bragged about spending time there, claiming to have purchased drugs and watched hardcore videos not found on the regular internet. Lacey, curious and already interested in hacking, decided to check it out. I figured, what the hell, right? What could possibly be so bad about this Dark Web? Well, plenty, as it would turn out. As we browsed through this part of the internet, we lost count of the disturbing content, including animal torture, hitmen advertising their services, and drug dealers. Some videos seemed to be live streams of genuine torture. Despite all of this, Lacey seemed to have a strange fascination with the dark web, while I began to lose interest. Eventually, she came across a link to a place called TJ's Horror Shop. It sounded corny, but Lacey clicked on it anyway. She was greeted by a message informing that a show was taking place that night, but it was members only. The page allowed her to register, and she chose the username Southern Nerd 4. After her registration was accepted, a digital clock began counting down to the beginning of the live stream. When the clock hit zero, the screen lit up showing a masked man in leather and skull gloves. He was twiddling his fingers like Mr. Burns, and he spoke in a deep, distorted voice. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to TJ's Horror Shop. For all the newcomers, it is my pleasure to welcome you to my house of horrors. It seemed like a silly little show, but given everything else we had seen on the dark web so far, I wasn't convinced that something sinister was out of the question. Tonight's first victim, two other men, also wearing masks and dressed in leather, dragged in another person into view like he was some sort of hostage. He had a bag covering his head. Mr. Fleming of Charlotte, North Carolina, a 43-year-old divorced father of a son and daughter. He has been selected as the first victim of tonight's bloodbath. I began to feel sick to my stomach, and I noticed Lacey was beginning to look uncomfortable as well. 
For those of you who are new, my viewers are the ones who get to pick how our victims die. Your username is selected at random. After your name is chosen, a box will appear giving you several choices. The option you select is the method in which this poor bastard will die. One of TJ's henchmen ripped the bag off the hostage. The man was sobbing in terror, pathetically begging for his life. I sincerely hoped this was all just an act, but I was becoming less certain of that by the second. Now, let the selection process begin. On the left side of the screen, all the usernames of those watching began to briefly flash up at random. Apparently, some sort of algorithm was using some kind of lottery system to pick who would determine this man's fate. Eventually, it settled on the username who gives a crap 771. One of our favorite guests, TJ shouted in glee. Now you must choose how Mr. Fleming will meet his demise. Three boxes appeared, offering the following choices. Strangulation, mutilation, gunshots. The user settled with gunshots. Very well then, let the carnage begin. One of the masked henchmen appeared from off-screen, armed with a sawed-off shotgun. He aimed the gun at the man's genitalia and fired. Lacey and I both gasped in horror, while Mr. Fleming howled in extreme agony. The henchman lifted the man up and shot him in both kneecaps, causing him to drop back onto the floor and continue begging for mercy. But his pleas fell on deaf ears. The henchman took out a 9mm pistol and emptied the entire clip into his back. I couldn't bear to watch anymore. I looked away and lost my lunch. I heard one more gunshot, and the man's screaming stopped. I guess that was the fatal blow. What a delightfully gruesome display. Now, on to our next contestant. The henchman dragged another person into view, also with a bag over their head. The bag was removed to reveal a blonde female, not much older than me. Melissa Cartmel of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 23 years old and single. You are our next victim. Now, let's see who gets to decide your fate. As before, the slot on the left side of the screen began flashing names at random. And much to our horror, it settled on the username Lacey had chosen. Tears began to well up in Lacey's eyes. Lacey, shut this damn thing off, I said to her. Southern Nerd 4, for a newcomer, we are pleased to welcome you into our gruesome family. Now, you must choose how Miss Cartmel dies. Again, two small boxes appeared, but with different options this time. Electrocution or incineration. Lacey only sat there frozen in horror. Lacey, get off this page now, I said in an increased panic. Several minutes passed, and TJ had grown impatient. Well, Southern Nerd, we are waiting. Lacey began to frantically press buttons, hoping it would somehow allow her to exit this awful place. If you don't choose within the next 20 seconds, you will be on our next show, TJ said menacingly. For a moment, Lacey appeared to be considering one of the three murderer options. But before she could choose, I ripped the power cord out of its outlet and shut the damn computer off. Lacey broke down, sobbing, and I rushed over to comfort my cousin. You don't think they'll find me, do you? She said fearfully. I don't know. I stayed with Lacey a few more days before returning to the apartment where I was staying in Los Angeles. I wanted classes to resume so I could get on with my degree in sports journalism, but it was the middle of July. The whole situation with those wackos on the dark web appeared to have blown over, or so I thought. I opened up my laptop as soon as I returned home, and I was greeted with a horrifying sight. 
My generic desktop background had been replaced with an image of a masked man, the same type of mask I saw TJ and his henchmen wearing in that terrible live stream. Suddenly, a video box appeared, and a video message began playing. Hello there, Jason. It's me, TJ. Shivers went down my spine at the mention of my name. Where the hell did he get it from? And how the hell did he manage to hack into my laptop? I believe we have a hostage here that might be of interest to you. The camera angle changed. Oh no, it can't be. Lacey, she was bound and gagged, sobbing in the corner of the room where TJ was filming. There were cuts and bruises on her face. Remember when I told your cousin here that she would be a part of our next show? I'm a man of my word, Jason. She had a choice to make, and she refused to answer the call. Now, she will pay the ultimate price, he said, bending down and petting her hair in a very creepy manner, causing her to cringe. Or will she? I sat there motionless, waiting for what he would say next. I decided to make things a little more interesting for our next show. Your cousin will have a chance to survive if, and only if, you eliminate this man. A photograph of a middle-aged man appeared on my screen. Raymond Marshall, 53 years old, of Los Angeles, California. No particular reason why I chose this random person, except for the fact that he happens to live near you. Now, you have a simple choice. You will murder one person to potentially save another. Another box appeared on my screen showing the options of yes and no. I sat there in dead silence, trying to process everything. Should I become a murderer to save my cousin? I sat there, staring at the box, asking if I would accept taking on the task of killing this man who I've never even met. Twenty seconds, Jason. Tick-tock. Tick-tock, I heard TJ taunting. Not much time to consider things a very awful predicament to be in. TJ began audibly counting down. Ten, nine, eight, seven. At seven, I finally clicked on yes and regretted it almost instantly. So, you've agreed to play along. Very well, then. I will give you until Friday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, which is when our next show will be. Be warned, one of my associates is currently in Los Angeles, and he's watching your every move. You know, just in case you try to chicken out. Oh, and we're also monitoring your communications, so don't even think about calling the police. Don't even think about attempting to warn your target, either. I knew right then and there I was trapped. I was going to be a murderer, or not, all for the chance of saving Lacey. If you haven't eliminated your target by then, my henchmen will eliminate you. There is no backing out of this. Shouldn't be a problem. Your cousin tells me you're an excellent shooter until Friday at 6 p.m. Well, at least he gave me time to mentally prepare. That's a little over two days. From now late at night, I was tossing and turning. I couldn't sleep. My consciousness was deeply troubled, and I was wishing I could die. But that would be viewed as chickening out and surely get Lacey killed. I decided I wasn't going to wait until Friday. I wanted to get it over with now. I got dressed and walked out of the apartment parking garage. I opened up the toolbox in the bed of my pickup truck and stared at the assault rifle I'd used on many occasions for hog hunting when I was growing up in Texas. I had brought it with me to California when I drove out here to attend college, but I hadn't had the time to go hunting since moving out here. I pulled it out from the toolbox and tossed it into the back seat of the cab. Put this on, I heard a voice say, startled. I turned around and saw a tall man in a hooded sweatshirt wearing a mask. Let me guess, you're the psychopath's puppet, I said sarcastically. Put this on, he repeated in a more aggressive tone. 
He was holding a headset in his outstretched hand. I took it from him. This headset has a small camera planted inside it. It will provide a visual confirmation that you have carried out your task. Attempt to tamper with it, and I will kill you. They really had their bases covered. Such a lovely crowd you hang out with, I said to him as I climbed into my truck. I saw him turn around and walk away. I couldn't see him or his vehicle anywhere in sight. With that, I started the ignition and began driving to the address that TJ had provided me for this person. All the while, I saw a dark SUV with tinted windows following me the whole way. I tried to make out a license plate number, but the dim light made it very difficult. I eventually arrived on the street where my intended target lived. His house was directly across from the street from a park. I decided it would be easier to hide from my target if I parked my vehicle over there. I saw the SUV that had been tailing me make a sharp U-turn and park itself on the other side of the street. They weren't kidding. He was watching my every move. I rolled down my window slightly, just far enough for the muzzle to be sticking out. Just then, I heard my iPhone buzzing and felt it vibrate in my pocket. I had it shut off but it just suddenly reactivated itself without my prompting. I took the phone out of my pocket and realized what was up. TJ and his cronies were hacking into it. I was greeted by the familiar image of a masked man dressed in leather. Welcome back again, loyal subscribers. As usual, we have quite a show for you in store. Before we get to the main event, he went off screen for a few moments and then dragged a woman in front of the camera, hands tied, mouth covered in duct tape. It was Lacey. Will a man become a murderer for even the smallest chance of saving his cousin? To find out, let's go to Los Angeles. On my phone, the image of TJ was replaced with the live camera feed from the headset his henchman had given me. I knew this was my cue to look at the target's house across the street. I noticed the henchman got out of his parked SUV and walked up the man's driveway. Apparently, this man was a night owl. The lights in his house were all on, and I saw a kid's TV blaring. Maybe he lived alone. The masked man rang the doorbell and stepped off to the side of the house to hide. A man arrived at the door. It was him, my target. I heard him shout, Hello, who's there? I took a step outside. That was it, my moment of truth. I gathered every ounce of strength and fortitude I could muster and pulled the trigger. A direct hit right between the eyes. Raymond Marshall was dead before he hit the ground. The henchman emerged from the side of the house and walked up to the corpse to visually verify that he was dead. After he had done so, he looked in my direction and gave me some kind of hand gesture, presumably a signal of verification. Well, there you have it. Our friend did indeed have it in him to carry out this murder. And since I'm in a generous mood, I will not kill his cousin. I heard TJ shouting over my phone. The henchman got back into his SUV and drove off, and in the night, I watched as he drove away. I breathed a sigh of relief, but that relief was short-lived. TJ backed away from the camera, and another one of his henchmen appeared on screen armed with a shotgun. After a slight hesitation, he shot Lacey dead. I was in utter shock and disbelief. I had done exactly what the psychopath had asked me to do, and Lacey was still murdered. I had just done something I found to be morally unconscionable in the hopes she would be spared, and as it turned out, it was all for nothing. I spent the next two days sobbing in despair. My cousin, who I had loved more like an older sister, was gone forever. I found out that my aunt and uncle had filed a missing persons report. They had tried to contact her several days ago, but couldn't get a hold of her. I feigned ignorance about what had happened because I just couldn't bring myself to tell them. 
I sat alone in my room back in my apartment pondering what to do next. Those men had to be punished, but one doesn't maintain a murder show on the dark web without being masterful at covering their tracks. But even the most careful criminals slip up eventually. Then I remembered something. The headset I had worn that night. The one with the camera installed. Could it possibly still have footage on it? Perhaps not, but I decided it was worth a shot. I didn't really have any other options. But I remembered the basic hacking tricks Lacey had taught me. I put the headset next to my laptop and went to work. It was a pain in the neck, but I was finally able to hack into the headset's camera. I expected to see nothing but a blank screen. But much to my surprise, I discovered a memory file in the camera. I clicked the file. And yes, footage from the murder. They had slipped up and forgotten to delete the memory, but that was only the starting point. I needed something else to go on. The henchman had kept his mask on the whole time, making it damn near impossible to identify him. The video reached the point where the henchman drove off, and I noticed something. There was a short moment where the vehicle passed under a bright street lamp before disappearing into the darkness. I saw a license plate, but the image was a little blurry. I hacked in a little more to see if I could clear up the resolution. It worked, and I got a clearer look. It was a Nevada license plate. Yes, one step closer now. I typed that license plate number into the database. The vehicle was registered to a man named Zachary Parker in Reno, Nevada, about a seven hour drive from Los Angeles. I was also able to acquire his address, and I knew I was now on the trail of my cousin's killers. You're going down, TJ. I'll make sure of that, even if it kills me. I packed some food, some rope and duct tape, as well as a handgun and a hunting knife that I had brought with me when I drove out to California two years ago. I ended up purchasing a taser gun and pepper spray, just in case. Also, I brought a tape recorder just in case I might need it. I told my roommates that I was taking a short trip and would be back in a few days. But truthfully, I had no idea if I would be coming back at all. These were some bad characters that I was dealing with. I departed Los Angeles at approximately 1 p.m., but extreme traffic issues added another hour to my trip. I arrived in Reno at around 10 o'clock at night. It took me a while to find the address because I wasn't exactly familiar with the area, but eventually, I arrived on a quiet street in a nice-looking neighborhood. It was a medium-sized single-story house, similar in appearance to the one I'd grown up in in Texas. And there it was, in the driveway. The black Toyota 4Runner with the same license plate number. I stepped out of my truck and began to creep up to the house, hoping nobody in the street would notice me. Suddenly, the garage door began to open. I ducked to the side of the house to keep myself out of sight. I saw a man step out from the garage entrance, get into the SUV and start it up. But he wasn't going anywhere. He simply moved the vehicle into the garage before shutting it off, and I heard a vehicle door opening and shutting once more. I took my chance. I bolted for my hiding spot and snuck into the garage, using the SUV to hide behind. The man didn't even notice. He closed the garage door, shut off the light, and walked back into the house. I stayed inside the garage for about half an hour, believing he might be going to bed soon since it was late at night. Eventually, I made it to the door leading to the garage and opened it as quietly as I could. I had entered the laundry room, and there was another door. I opened that one and saw a dark hallway at the end of the hallway was a bedroom with its door partially opened and the light on. I heard what sounded like gargling. He was, in fact, getting ready for bed. I slowly crept down the dark hallway, careful not to make a sound. I quietly set down the duffel bag I had brought with me and pulled out the taser I had purchased the day before. 
I heard the creaking noise of the man sitting down on the edge of his bed. That's when I made my move. I burst through the door and shot the man with the taser. I made sure he was electrocuted for a good, long time. I wanted him to suffer, and also to ensure he wouldn't be able to resist while I bound him to a chair in the corner of the bedroom. He was bigger than me, after all. Some time had passed, and he had regained his composure. He looked straight up at me and gasped in shock. What the hell are you doing here? How in God's name did you find me? You got sloppy, I said dryly before smiling devilishly. Bet you never thought I'd find you, huh? He just glared at me contemptuously. Start talking. Names and locations, dirtbag. I ain't telling you anything, he said defiantly. Fine, I've got plenty of time. In the meantime, we'll just see how much you can take. See how tough you really are. He gulped nervously. We can do this the easy way or the hard way, Zachary. Screw you, he shouted. I pulled out my handgun and shot him twice in his left leg. He screamed too loudly, and I couldn't help but gain a great deal of satisfaction from watching him in agony. Not so tough when your victims fight back, are you? Now, start talking. Go to hell. Perhaps I will, but I'm going to drag you down there with me. I then pulled out the can of pepper spray and blasted him squarely in the face which led to more screaming. I made sure he got a large dosage. His eyes watered like a faucet, and mucus began dripping out of his nose. Talk. You're getting nothing from me. All right, then. I guess I need to up the ante. I then pulled out the hunting knife. Let's see. Your fingers, your toes, or your gonads. He stared at me silently. I'll settle with gonads. I moved in closer and began to press the knife against the man's crotch. All right, I'll talk. I pulled back and smiled with satisfaction. That's more like it. He spilled the beans on the names and addresses of every one of his co-workers, even gave me the address of the abandoned warehouse where they hold their live streams. He said they were planning to have another show tomorrow night. As much as I hated this man, I didn't actually want to kill him. I would have preferred these men be kept alive to suffer in prison forever. But I couldn't take the chance that he might try to warn his buddies that I got on their trail. I pressed the handgun against his temple and was about to pull the trigger. Then I heard a whimper, but it wasn't coming from Zachary. It came from down the hallway. What the hell is that? I said. Stepping back from Zachary, it's nothing. There's nothing there. But I was already out of Zachary's bedroom. I heard the whimpering noise coming from another room in the hallway. I opened the door and was heartbroken at what I saw. In the corner of an empty bedroom lay two children, a boy and a girl, tied up and gagged. They couldn't have been any older than eight or nine years old. I dialed the police to report a kidnapping, then departed Zachary's house unnoticed, with an arrest imminent. He wasn't going to be able to warn those bastards. I spent the better part of the next day staking out the abandoned warehouse Zachary had told me about. Perhaps I could have spent some of the day exploring Reno, but I couldn't keep my mind focused on anything except bringing those bastards down. Eventually. The sun started to go down, and I decided to make my move on the warehouse. Whether TJ and his buddies had arrived or not, I took the back entrance in hopes that I would not draw attention to myself. I had my sniper rifle, hunting knife, flashlight, and taser with me. If what I had seen from their live streams was any indication, it was that they always came armed. I slowly opened the back door but that didn't stop it from creaking loudly. I tried to maintain my bravado, but that damn creaking noise made me fear I had given away my presence. I decided to press forward despite my fears. 
my sniper rifle pointing in front of me at all times. The factory was very dim and quiet. Every little noise I heard made me nervous as hell, but I wasn't going to turn back now. I had simply come too far down the tracks to abort. There was a musty smell in the air, but it soon gave way to the smell of death. I recognized it instantly. Spend as much time hog hunting as I have, and you know what the dead bodies smell like. I traced the stench to a door at the end of the hallway. I opened the door and shined my flashlight into the dark room, sweeping the beam across. I saw some freshly dead bodies, some of whom were children. I shone the light to the other side and saw three people bound and gagged in the corner, one man and two women. Using my hunting knife, I cut the ropes, binding them. Are you a cop? The male captive asked. No, I'm just here to help. I reply, pointing at the corpses in the room. What's that? Last night's victims? They haven't gotten around to burying them yet. They're running some kind of internet horror show in this place, said one of the female captives. And we were next in line, said the other female captive. Not anymore, I reply. Go get the police and bring them back here. We're shutting them down for good. Are you sure you'll be all right? Asked the male captive. I'll be fine. These people aren't as tough as they think they are. Now go. All three of them scattered out of there as fast as they could. I was left alone to wait for TJ and his cronies. Eventually, I reached the main area of the factory. It was mostly empty, except for a few desks, a computer with a webcam, and some extension cords. I noticed the ladder leading up to the catwalk above. I decided that would be a good place to hide while I continued to wait for their arrival. As it turned out, the wait wouldn't be very long. Less than 10 minutes had passed before I saw four men entering the building through an entrance in the front. They weren't wearing their masks. The man up front was tall, lean, and had blonde hair. Where the hell is Zachary? Have you been able to get a hold of him yet? The blonde-haired man shouted in frustration. I presumed this man to be TJ. I've been trying to get a hold of him all day, but... But what? I drove by his house this morning. It was crawling with cops. I guess one of his neighbors knew about those kidnapped children, the blonde man said in frustration. Fine, we'll just have to do it without him then. He was always a little careless. I should have known bringing him on board was a mistake. Oh, if you only knew TJ, I quietly whispered to myself. TJ approached the desk with the computer and turned it on. Bring out those three hostages. We'll begin tonight's show within the next half hour. You got it, boss, one of the other men said as he disappeared down the hallway. I readied my sniper rifle from my perch on the catwalk. The moment of confrontation was arriving. TJ fiddled around on the computer for a minute when we suddenly heard a loud scream. The hell was that? TJ said. The henchman reappeared, looking frantic and sweating profusely. Our hostages, they're gone. What do you mean they're gone? TJ asked incredulously. They're gone. The door to the storage room is wide open. I walked in and they weren't there. The rope we had used to bind them had been cut. I saw TJ face palming. How the hell did... Never mind. We gotta get out of here. If those people somehow escaped, we can expect the cops to be here soon. I wasn't going to give them that chance. I aimed the sniper rifle at the frantic henchman's kneecap and fired. The henchman fell to the ground, shrieking in pain. TJ and the two remaining accomplices began frantically looking around hoping to find the person who had shot their friend. One of them walked in front of my sightline, and I got a clear shot at his back. I fired and struck him in his spinal cord, ensuring he would be paralyzed for the rest of his life. 
Now it was down to the last of TJ's cronies. I shot him in the right kneecap, but this victory was short-lived. I heard a gunshot ricochet behind me. TJ had spotted me. I got up and ran as fast as I could across the catwalk. I heard one more gunshot, then another. He pumped the shotgun once more, but I heard a clicking noise when he pulled the trigger. Using this opportunity, I shot TJ in both of his legs, and down he went like the sack of shit he is. I climbed down the nearest ladder to get back to floor level. Finally, I had a chance to confront my cousin's killer. He looked shocked to see me. You surprised? How does it feel to have someone fight back? How did you? Wait, don't tell me. Zachary, like you said, he was always a little careless. And it came back to bite you in the butt, big time, I said smugly. He chuckled. Okay, now what? You'll be going to prison, along with us. Or did you forget the murder you committed on our behalf? You mean under pain of death? You blackmailed me and told me you would spare my cousin. No, I said, I might spare her. And in case you forgot, it was my henchman who shot her, not me. Close enough. These men follow your orders like sheep. You could have told them not to do it, and you sat there and watched. The blood is on your hands, I said, very angrily. Do you deny any of this? I asked. No, I don't deny it. In fact, I admit all of it. Thanks. You've given me exactly what I needed, TJ said nervously. I then pulled out my tape recorder and played back the recording. TJ looked shocked at hearing his own confession. It's over, TJ. You have nowhere else to go, I declared. TJ gulped nervously. Are you going to kill me? Seconds after he said those words, we began hearing sirens in the distance, getting closer and closer. I put two and two together and realized that those people I had set free had contacted the police and directed them here. I looked back down at TJ one last time. I saw your little storage room in the back. I couldn't help but notice some of your victims were children. Child killers don't get treated very well in prison. So no, I will not kill you or your cronies. Someone in prison will do it for me. I smiled rather smugly and triumphantly as TJ began panicking. TJ and his followers all received life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. I myself ended up on trial for my vigilante actions. But after a hearing where I had helped rescue two kidnapped children and three other hostages, the jury was clearly on my side. They returned with a not guilty verdict. Additionally, the tape recording of TJ's confession played at the trial. This meant two things. Firstly, my aunt and uncle received closure on what happened to Lacey, and secondly, the district attorney in Los Angeles would not prosecute me for the murder of Raymond Marshall. Although I'm glad the story had somewhat of a happy ending, I realize that situations like this are an extreme exception. Take my advice, stay away from the dark web. It's for your own good. Story number two. If you could just give me a moment, I'll explain. I'll have to be fast though. I don't know how close they are. Essentially, I ordered my own death on the dark web. I'm a drug user, I'll admit it. Weed is my usual go-to, but I buy that off my friend. If, however, I want to get something a little heavier like acid or coke, I'll just order it off the dark web. It's surprisingly simple. A few clicks, some bitcoin transfers, and then boom. I'll have acid in my P.O. box. But I'm also a curious guy. The dark web has always intrigued me. Up until a few days ago, I had only been on there to buy drugs off sites some of my friends gave to me. But late one night, I was sober and at home, which was a rare thing for me. So, 
Since I was bored, I decided to boot up my Tor browser and try to see what sort of screwed up crap I could find in the dark web. If you've ever been on the dark web, you'll know that you can't just search up Red Rooms or Hitman for hire and get results. No, you have to find links for these websites first. So, I hopped back onto Google again and tried to find some links to a messed up website. I know it's weird that I was actively searching for the worst, but as soon as I got on the dark web that night, I had a sense of morbid curiosity overcome me. Anyways, I spent a little while trying to find some links. Anything I found, though, was either too tame for me or links that didn't work. At this point, I was about ready to give up and I wish I had. But in one final attempt, I clicked on Reddit, hopping into r slash deep web. I didn't think I would find anything, so I just scrolled through for about half an hour before sorting by new. Then I found it. One simple text post titled Slayer's Assassination and Life Ruining Services. In the text box in the post was what seemed to be just a random assortment of numbers and letters. It took my entire brain a second to figure out what it was, but I realized pretty quickly it was a link, presumably to a Hitman website. So, I decided to paste the link into my dark web browser, and what do you know, it worked. But before I decided to go any further, I figured I should go back into the OP's profile to see if they had posted any other dark web links. However, when I went back to the posting in question, OP's profile was deleted. Anyways, I reopened my dark web tab and hopped onto the site. Up along the top of the website was its name, Slayer's Assassination and Life Ruining Services, and next to it, what looked to be a skull inside a crosshair. I chuckled when I saw that. The site must be fake. Upon scrolling down, however, I was not disappointed. It was a paragraph of white text on a black background, in a small box to the right of the text that just said, place an order. The text was the main part, though. As it took up most of the page, it read, Slayer's assassinations and life-ruining services offer everything from acid attack, crippling, blinding, castration, torture, beatings, and good old death. We have the lowest prices out of any company running similar services, and we are worldwide. We have a dedicated and experienced group of staff based all over the world. If you need someone to be assassinated, or maybe you just want them scarred for life, don't hesitate to contact us. Again, I laughed. This had to be satire, right? Hell, I was even tempted to order it on someone just to see what would happen. Ironically, I actually have a half-decent job, so I can afford to. But better not to risk it, though, I thought to myself. I was about to close my computer and call it a night when I heard a knock at the door. I live alone, so it was unusual to get visitors, especially so late at night. But when I opened my door, it was just my good buddy Mark, who also happened to be my weed plug. As I opened the door, he didn't hesitate to let himself in and shove a big baggie full of pot in my face. Dude, this is the best crap I've had in a minute. We gotta try some. I couldn't say no. Cut to a couple of hours later. It's early morning, and Mark and I are chilling on the couch, both blazed as hell. He suddenly decides to get up and I assume he's going to get some leftover pizza. But he walks over to my desk and computer. Slayer's assassinations. Are you gonna kill someone or something? He mutters. What? I reply. Your computer, dude. It's got some hacker crap on it. It's the dark web, man. Don't screw with it. At this point, I'm still on my couch, half asleep and not paying full attention. However, I sit up pretty fast when he says the words, Bro, let's order a hitman on you. I hopped up and walked over to my PC. Part of my brain was screaming, No, 
What the hell are you doing? But the majority of my brain, which was also the high part, was thinking about how funny it would be to order a hitman on myself. So, I agree. I do make him get out of the chair though, because I didn't want him seeing what my wallet password was as I transferred some Bitcoin. At the end, after I wrote all my personal details like my address, age, and even a photo, I had to select what I wanted to happen to me. I just selected plain old assassination, as it was actually cheaper than some of the other things. I could have paid an extra couple of grand to be beaten before my death, but even my high brain didn't want to splash the cash too much on my own death. God, this is ridiculous. Anyways, I placed the order and then replied to my confirmation email. And boom, it was done. A couple of clicks, and I had ordered myself on the dark web. Mark and I laughed about it for a while, but then he left about an hour later, and I fell asleep not too long after. I woke up around 9 a.m., which meant I got at least six hours of sleep, even if it felt like I got three. I got up and out of bed, threw on some track pants and a cotton shirt, and brewed myself a coffee before sitting down to play some games and just enjoy my Sunday. Can you imagine how shocked I was when I saw that I had ordered my death the previous night? Even though I still thought the sight was bullcrap, I still felt a pit open up in my stomach. Even when I'm high, I usually can make sensible decisions. I chuckled. Not like I could remember it anyway, but I guess Mark's new crap was really good. I would assume a normal human being would be able to do something else but I was still kind of out of it from the night before, so I just carried on with my day. I was a little more paranoid, sure, but as I said, I just assumed it was BS. I even laughed at the email I got from the website, saying that their hitman had been dispatched and was on its way. It was like ordering a package off of Amazon. I was tempted to email back and ask for same-day delivery, but I didn't. I didn't need to ask, because that's exactly what I got. I didn't see it arrive, but around the time I started to cook myself a crappy dinner, I noticed a blacked out sedan parked on the other side of the road from my house. I didn't live in a rural area, but there were a lot of trees and bushes between each of the houses on my street, so I would be surprised if any other house saw the car except for mine. At this point, I was freaking out. What if the sight was real? I don't own any weapons, aside from a slightly larger than average kitchen knife. Screw it, I'm confronting it, I decided. I put on a hoodie and slid the knife into my front pocket before waltzing out of my own house and walking right up to the driver's side window of the vehicle. Even I was astonished at my own courage, knocking on the window. Nothing happened. It was rather anticlimactic. I was fully prepared to have a fight for my life. All because I did something really dumb while I was baked. But like I said, nothing happened. I even put my head right up to the window, as if there was a reflection to try and get a better look. I could barely see what was inside of the car, but all I could make out were two empty seats. No one was even inside. I got all hyped up for nothing. I decided to wait out by the car for a bit. But after half an hour or so, I was hungry, and I had to go back inside to take my dinner out of the oven. I swear, it was only a minute between me going inside to take my dinner out of the oven and looking back out of the window, and the car was gone. I didn't even hear it go. Guess I'm eating my dinner with all my curtains closed and doors locked. I muttered to myself. I had just started to calm down when the power shut off. It was sunny outside, and coupled with a car, I now knew that this was the real deal. I had signed my own death warrant. I ran into my upstairs bedroom and locked the door, and then hid under the bed. I couldn't call the cops. What would I say? Oh yes, hello, sir. Turns out, while super high, I paid 5k for some anonymous hitman to kill me. So, 
I just stayed hidden under my bed. And now I've been here for an hour writing this. Think of this as my epitaph. I know I'm scared. Just a minute ago, I heard my back door slowly creaking open. This piece of writing may seem humorous to you, but in reality, as you read this, I'm under my bed praying to God that I lost all faith in years ago to spare me. But I know that won't happen. My bedroom door just opened and I can see a big pair of black boots. This is the curator. I hope you've enjoyed today's scary stories. Until next time.